to improve biodiversity monitoring across the globe. He has used passive acoustic monitoring to study the impacts of natural gas exploration, mining, and forest certification on the Peruvian avifauna and to study the effects of climate change on species distributions of frogs and birds in Puerto Rico. All right, should I get started? Okay, uh, thank you, Joyce, and thank you, Matthew. Uh, my name is Zephyr Gold, and um, thank you so much for the introduction. I am the Director of uh, Product Impact and Client Success at Rainforest Connection. And um, looks like you guys have a really exciting weekend ahead. Uh, that was a great presentation, Joyce. Um, sounds like, you know, thank you for the, to the Blueprint Planning Committee for inviting myself and Marconi to this, uh, this day today. And um, yeah, it just looks like you guys have a lot of exciting stuff to do this weekend. So I'm hoping that maybe sharing a few things about Rainforest Connection can help get those creative juices flowing and maybe um, inspire you guys a little bit about what we've, we've done in the last uh, seven years. So, um, so Rainforest Connection is a nonprofit tech startup and we are um, a, uh, on the cutting edge of conservation technology. We, uh, we build and deploy scalable open source solutions that um, can monitor biodiversity around the world as well as halt illegal activities. So um, today I'm gonna to talk about the biodiversity monitoring technology that we do, just in line with the Blueprint for Progress uh, weekend uh, here, the theme. Thought I would talk, talk a little bit more about our biodiversity monitoring technology. You may have heard about Rainforest Connection in the context of uh, illegal logging, stopping illegal logging. And that's one kind of our big area that we're really known well for, our, um, our RFCX Guardian. And um, you can definitely check that out on our website and learn more about that. But today I wanted to talk about uh, what we do in the conservation space in terms of biodiversity monitoring. So, um, so as an ecologist, biologist, their goal is to really go out and probably a lot of people know this already, but um, to basically go out into the field and collect audio using like small acoustic sensors, such as the audio moth is a very popular device that's used. Um, but the idea is to go out and collect audio uh, for you know long periods of time, maybe like a week or a month or a few months. Maybe those, uh, those devices are placed in a, a few different areas to get as much data as possible from the surrounding ecosystems. So say, you know, as a scientist, I go out there and I maybe place 50 of these audio auth devices in a particular region. And um, next, what I really need to do is be able to go back and retrieve those after a certain period of time, go back, retrieve those, and then I bring it back to my computer. I need to upload all that audio because the idea is that I wanna go and I wanna study, you know, I wanna understand what's happening in that ecosystem. So maybe there's a particular species, endangered species that I'm studying. And so I want to, I wanna go and I wanna see like, how often is that species making that particular call? Um, how many species are there there? What's the population richness? What's the species richness? So I really wanna like have this high level understanding of what's happening in the ecosystem. And so, I come back, I have all this audio. So can you imagine like, you know, so you have a 50 of these recorders that have been streaming constantly for a week or a month. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of files that you would have. And so what we've done is we've built um, a system for, um, for uploading that audio into a platform called RFCX Arbamon, which is basically, it's a scientific platform that allows you to go in and actually analyze uh, your audio. So be able to go through and have a way of really seeing, uh, coming up with some pretty sophisticated ways of analyzing that audio, understanding what's happening in that audio, visualizing what's in that audio. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the different tools that we have for analyzing that audio in just a second. But from there, the goal is then to be able to derive sufficient um, insights and conclusions from that audio that's that you've been anal analyzing and actually publish papers. So um, Marconi is going to go into a lot of detail about um, actual papers that you know we've published, that he's published, and um, and and the kinds of data that we've he's extrapolated from using Arbamon. So he'll go into kind of the details, that the real life application, the scientific application of using this tool. But um, but I'll just kind of show a few really cool examples from Arbamon, and just also mention a few more things about Arbamon as well. So it is a free cloud-based platform uh, with unlimited storage and processing capabilities. 
which is pretty huge because uh, scientists are, you know, they're studying around the, around the world and they need to be able to upload their audio and be able to access it anywhere they are. And so that's pretty powerful. Um, and then the, the platform has four main analytical tools, pattern matching, which is an object, re uses um, object recognition technology. And I'll go into that in a second. Random forest model is a AI tool and CNNs are also artificial intelligence as well. And then the soundscape analysis provide sort of like a holistic um, overview of the ecosystem, which I'm going to go to in detail as well. So I'm going to just kind of show you as a, two more cool slides before handing this over to, to Marconi. So basically pattern matching is a really powerful tool in which these scientists are using um, this object recognition technology, cross-correlation analysis, to take a snippet of audio. So this here represents a, uh, this bird call. So this is the uh, tinamous really, uh, really beautiful bird here that's found in, uh, in uh, Panama. And um, this bird makes this particular sound that matches this sound signature like this. So you can see that as a scientist, I went in here, I listened to the audio and I detected that, okay, this is the sound of this tinamous that I want to study. So what I've done is I've created a little snippet of this audio. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually run that over 70,000 one minute recordings. So remember I talked about all those, you know, weeks of recordings that I've uploaded into the system. So 70,000 recordings, I wanna go and I wanna find every match of this, this sound signature to those 70,000 recordings. And I don't wanna just sit and listen to every single recording, right? That would be hugely time consuming and just a painful process as you can imagine, very tedious. So what our system allows you to do is basically find all examples of this sound signature in those 70,000 recordings. And so as you can see, these are all the, the matches that our system has found. So we've ordered these in um, the order of like the highest and most likely to, to be matched. So the highest uh, correlation with this original sound signature. And you can see that these are all the different matches. And from here, the scientist is able to actually play to make sure that this is indeed the sound. Um, they're able to visualize this in further detail if they need to, and they're able to indicate, yes, that this is, you know, this is an actual match. So it allows them to very, very quickly label huge amounts of, of data, like I said, 70,000 recordings in this case, and then be able to then export that and actually analyze that using other statistical platforms such as um, R or others. So a second really powerful way that we're able to analyze audio using Arbonne is the soundscape analysis. So this allows the scientists to really have maybe say 24 hours worth of audio. This is what this represents. This is, this is on the, the axis down here, we've got 24, uh, zero to 24. So this is one day's worth of audio recordings. And then this is a frequency axis up here. The Y axis is the frequency. So uh, what you can see here is the different concentrations of high areas of acoustic activity. So you can see that there's uh, the really cool thing is that it, sh it this is many different recordings. So it's, like I said, 24 hours worth of recordings. So you can see that there are specific areas of concentration of audio activity that this um, frog or similar types of species, not just this guy, but um, others that are in this frequency range here. Um, and you can see that this is like kind of during the night, right? So um, this is, sorry, this is blocking, so I can't quite quite see, but, <laughs> but, um, but basically from the hours of about, uh, I think it's through about 5 a.m., uh, this, this guy is making some really cool sounds. And um, a little higher in the frequency range, uh, uh, 20,000 20, uh, kilohertz, we've got um, this guy here, which is like a, you know, grasshopper, and he's making some really cool sounds up here. So this, this shows that there's a high concentration of activity of this guy here, and this shows that there's a high concentration of activity of the frog. And then as we move into the daytime, so this is approximately 7 a.m., you have the cicadas and other similar insects that are vocalizing and they're making some like lots of sounds. So this whole area, this region represents all of those insects making that, making those sounds. And then, um, and you can also see there's some, some concentration of activity for this bird here. Not as much though as, as the cicadas and the, you know, these other cool little creatures. Um, but then once it becomes nighttime again, you can see that the frogs start to make, uh, start to vocalize again as well. So this just offers just like this really cool holistic understanding of what's happening in this 24 hour audio or period of audio. 
And then what you could do is you could take a similar 24 hours and maybe in a different area of the rainforest that had been like logged, for instance, and you could compare that and see like the real impact of that logging on the actual ecosystem sounds. And so you could really see a huge difference between um, the, the richness of the, the ecosystem before and after the logging had taken place. And for that, I'm gonna take it over, I'm gonna hand it over to Marconi, who's gonna give a lot more detail as to the, the real life applications of this using this tool in um, biodiversity monitoring around the world. So thank you everybody and I'm turning it over to Marconi. So hello everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Marconi Campos and I'm a tropical ecologist. Uh, I have been working with acoustic monitoring for 12 years now, mostly trying to understand how animal species are responding to both human and, and, and natural uh, impact. So here I just want to give you some examples of, on how we are using the RBMON platform to really answer some of these important ecological questions. Um, can, can you move that for the next slide? Yeah, thank you. So one of the things that we are really interested in is to understand if, if we can use the soundscape analysis, the soundscape that, just, that, that Zeth just showed you, to, as a proxy to uh, species richness, to number of species. So let's take a look on those two soundscapes that we have uh, here in the page. So one is from Puerto Rico and another one is from the Peruvian Amazon. So we can read this uh, soundscape pretty much as the same way that Zeth uh, uh, showed us. So we have hours of the day and frequency and the hot colors mean that, is, that we have like a lot of acoustic activity going on and the colder colors means that we don't have much acoustic activity going on. So it is easy to see that uh, the soundscapes from the Peruvian Amazon is much more occupied, right? And, and saturated. So we have much more acoustic activity going on on different hours of the day and in different frequencies. So one of the things that we did uh, was to um, try to, uh, we, 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 sorry, we evaluate, we identify all bird, frog, mammal and insect species in recordings in eight uh, forest sites in, in Latin America to try to see if we can see a correlation between the number of species and how saturated the soundscape were. So, and what we find, found was that, yes, we have a very strong and positive relationship between number of species and how saturated or occupied is the soundscape. So yes, we can use the soundscape as a proxy of uh, biodiversity. And the, the, the other, the other um, uh, item that we are very interested in is to try to understand how a species are responding to climate change. And right now we are going to take advantage of the pattern matching that that show us. And the idea here is uh, to deploy uh, several recorders, audio recorders in the field, uh, leave the recorders there for a few days, for some weeks, for, for months, for, for years, and then extract that information, that presence and absence information detection and non-detection information to try to understand how species are distributed in the landscape. So here we have like an overview of the or, or workflow uh, of the pattern matching, where we have these uh, presence and absence data combined with environmental variables, such as elevation, temperature, and forest type to help us to create these species distribution maps so that we can uh, improve the way that we monitor fauna and manage the fauna around the globe. And uh, one thing that we did here in Puerto Rico was uh, over 700 sampling sites, we create these distribution maps for both for historical era, era for current and future uh, periods. And then we combine those maps in these different uh, temporal scales to find those areas that are always suitable for, for, for the species. So we are calling these uh, always suitable areas. And we did that for uh, 24 bird species and 10 frog species in Puerto Rico. And um, can, can you uh, pass through? Yeah, thank you, Zach. 
So here you can see the always suitable areas for each one of the bird species in Puerto Rico. And what we did next was to combine the, the, the maps of all those bird species, all the always suitable areas for all bird species and overlap that information with protected areas in Puerto Rico. So actually we did that for birds and frogs. And what we found was that, um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, what we found was that, uh, so here, yeah, you can see uh, in the map, in, in this map here, uh, there are always suitable areas for birds. So you can see there is a high concentration of always suitable areas for birds in the west part of the island. Whereas for frogs, we have a high concentration of uh, always suitable areas in the east part of the island. That makes totally sense because the east part of the island is much more humid and receives much more precipitation. And one of the, the main results of this study, and it's kind of sad, is that we found that the majority of always suitable areas for both birds and frogs are actually outside of protected areas. Um, so, but, but again, uh, doing this exercise and this investigation, we were able to provide uh, stakeholders and wildlife managers uh, a map so they can, we can see where we can create new, new protected areas or maybe expand our, the existing protected areas. And um, more recently, we start working with a uh, convolutional neural network. It's a, a different type of uh, artific artificial intelligence model. And we start, started working with uh, birds and frogs in Puerto Rico. And I will not enter in details on how the convolutional neural network works. But one of the things that I love most in these kind of models is the ability to identify multiple species in just one click. Uh, the predictions are made in, in, the, in the raw recordings that we acquire directly from the field. And we are able to achieve high precision, even in communities such as in Puerto Rico, where we have a lot of overlapping sounds. So here in this figure, you can see that we were able to achieve higher than 0.8 uh, in precision for, for, for most bird and frog species in Puerto Rico. And uh, we start to uh, move along with the CNNs. And right now the idea is to create uh, regional CNNs for different parts of the world. And what I'm showing here uh, for you is not the result of the CNN because we are working right now to build that, those CNNs. But mostly what the, this table here show how we are using the pattern matching approach that I've just shown you to acquire uh, training data for this convolutional neural network. So actually what we are seeing here is how powerful is the pattern matching approach in identify and, and uh, different species. So you can see that right now for, for the Peruvian Amazon, we have more than 300 species detected in, in our database right now. In Ecuador, more than 200 species. In Panama, 120. Sumatra, 55, but that's still counting. We just started uh, working the Sumatra uh, data set. And also some interesting um, result, results is that we were able to identify some very endangered and endemic species in this data, database. So the idea is to complete this uh, CNN in the next few few uh, months and then or weeks, hopefully, and then um, provide that information for, for the community. And uh, I think that's it. I don't know if Zef wants to uh, comment in, on something. No, no, that's it. Yeah, no, thanks so much everybody for, you know, checking us out and uh, hope the, yeah, I'll just turn it over to the next uh, next group of speakers. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, guys. That was really incredible. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Eric is the former senior 
Director of the Exploration Technology Lab at the National Geographic Society, and he is now the co-founder of Second Star Robotics. As an engineer, he's done a lot of work developing technology for both terrestrial and marine conservation, including creating control systems for deep diving underwater robotics and discovering new methods for surveying archeological sites with radar. And currently he's working on developing autonomous sensor platforms to help monitor Earth's natural resources. So Eric, if you wanna go ahead and start, you're welcome to. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I'll figure out how to share my screen again um, here, but I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for, to the Duke Conservation as well as the, um, the Committee for Blueprint. And here we go, just, okay. Um, um, anyway, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, my, my talk is um, on technology and conservation from a small business perspective. A little bit of background for me. I um, started my career as a, um, a engineer working for a, a con as a contractor for General Atomics, and we were developing a, um, a system for collect capturing aircraft off of aircraft on aircraft carriers. The problem with the existing systems is they, they damage the aircraft a little bit every time they land because of the stresses that were put on it. So we, we basically built a system that would allow us to um, uh, actually um, use direct drive motors to, to control the forces that the air, airframes are experiencing. And I, I worked on the software to test that. So it was, it was an interesting project, but then I got the opportunity to work for the National Geographic Society um, in the, the exploration technology lab. And eventually I became the senior director and served there for um, 12 years. And uh, we primarily supported um, National Geographic uh, media groups, uh, explorers and grantees, and, um, and then some of the programmatic initiatives that National Geographic was working on. And um, one of those was um, doing a lot of work on uh, bio biodiversity conservation and they were focused uh, in terms of like their activities, they were focused on surveying, monitoring and protecting um, uh, regions of the, the world. And uh, the, one of the ones I'm referring to is called Pristine Seas. But, and so we developed technology to help them out as well as, um, as, well as uh, supported them with uh, in the field uh, systems that were basically bought or uh, purchased by us. Um, so an example is uh, we developed this package called Critter Cam, which is basically a camera plus a bunch of sensors that we could put on um, marine life to get to actually see uh, up close what uh, marine life are doing in their environment. And then um, uh, this is an example of, of, of us attempting to deploy it on a great white shark. So that the guy in the boat uh, without a shirt is actually my, my partner, co-founder business partner and co-founder of the company. And then uh, that's me with the this shark pole. It's kind of a low res image, but um, the idea is we lasso this um, over top of a, a shark and then we would, um, and then we would basically get a bird's eye or a shark's eye view of what's going on. And if you uh, go on YouTube and look up, um, type in falling into a shark, you can see a funny video of us uh, maybe failing at that. Um, and then we also developed a system, uh, uh, a land air system for the deep sea called, um, we called it the drop cam. And basically we could deploy this in the ocean for a low cost and collect uh, lit imagery of the seafloor. And um, this is an example of uh, a deployment in the Mariana Trench. That's actually the deepest jelly or deepest xenophile for ever seen. And then the next part, you're gonna see the deepest jellyfish ever seen. There's some more xenophile fours there. And we deployed this all over the world um, hundreds of times. And um, th this actually got a lot of interest from our, uh, our Pristine Seas uh, initiative, which was uh, lo looking at developing the scientific justification for establishing large scale marine protected areas around the world. Um, and uh, basically they uh, used the drop cam technology to survey the deep water while there was a, a scientific dive team surveying the shallow water. And then they would, um, they, they, they would develop a, a proposal and, and get uh, large scale preserves um, or large scale no-take reserves uh, established. And um, partly uh, because of this technology, they've established over 6 million square kilometers of protected reserves around the world. Um, 
And then uh, about a little over a year ago, um, my uh, a coll my colleague um, Charles Shepard and I decided that we would we would like to try something new, and we, we really enjoyed working at National Geographic, but we wanted to see what take our a stab at starting a small business. So we started Second Star Robotics, and we're actually based in Richmond, Virginia, right down I ninety five from Washington D.C. Um, we we're currently. Um, part of the the Build RBA um, product incubator, um, and we we're primarily a, 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 a hardware development company. We develop um, se sensors and sensor platforms, and um, most of our work is in the marine area. But we have been working in the um, uh, terrestrial um, area. This is a, a sensor we're developing for basically selectively detecting motion in frame using. Um, basically changes in uh, temperature in a scene. Um, so this is an example of a, a filter for <laughs> looking at squirrels and not birds in my backyard. Um, so we'll, we're hoping to de deploy this type of system, hopefully in the Osa Peninsula Reserve um, in Costa Rica sometime later this year, but um, stay tuned for more on this. But most of our work's been in developing um, uh, technology for uh, actually exploring the, the deep sea and looking at deep sea biodiversity. So. Um, one of the, the places in the ocean where the, um, most of the sea life actually lives, actually most animal, almost most of the animals on earth live is um, in the deep scattering layer. And it's basically a, a thin uh, a layer of zooplankton that lives just below the, or exists just below the photic zone where on the edge of the photic zone. And uh, these zooplankton travel up into the, um, <laughs> the upper regions of the ocean at night when the, when the sun sets and uh, feed and then they go back down as the sun rises. And this is uh, this migration is followed by the predators of those zooplankton as well, the lanternfish as well as predators of those animals, like things like squid. And there's a huge ecosystem built on, on zooplankton and, and um, it's huge, it's massive. It's considered the largest migration in the world. It happens twice a day and uh, very little is actually known about it. So we're working on a, uh, through a grant from um, NOAA, in collaboration with National Geographic as well as the Florida International University to develop a, a technology for actually exploring that scattering layer and seeing what's down there. And um, and this is another image of the scattering layer migrating. So it, it this is a 48 hour period. So you can see that smudge is actually the um, acoustic, sig the, they use an active acoustic sonar on the surface to observe where the animals are and then you can see it migrating to the surface fairly dramatically and then going back down. Um, so how do we actually um, how do we actually collect imagery or data from that um, that region of the ocean and we we looked at around at different methods and there's things like man submersibles and um, ROVs and uh, AUVs and we, we thought well we really only want to go vertically in the water because that's the direction the animals are moving. How do we move an object vertically in the water that that's relatively low energy and low low cost? And we we kind of took a hint from Archimedes, who figured out about two thousand years ago or three thousand years ago that um, if you change the volume of something but maintain its mass, you actually can affect a vertical force on that in a medium. So um, if you uh, you we created this buoyancy engine, and um, and it was sort of thought of. We, we consider it a low cost, low energy, low, low um, environmental impact way to actually uh, collect or move a vehicle in the, in the water column. And we came up with this concept. It's a, we call it the swarming drift cam, but the idea is that we can put some sensors and cameras and things into a glass sphere along with a buoyancy engine and, um, and a tracking system as well as a communication system. And, and we can have this vehicle move through the water column and, um, the idea is we'd build several of these and throw them in the ocean and, and they would kind of talk to each other and talk to a boat on the surface, maybe a surface tender. And that, that um, boat on the surface would have an active acoustic system as well as some other sensors. And we could control the, these vehicles and collect as much um, in situ data as possible while they go about their mig migratory event. Um, and one of the challenges is actually um, testing it and testing it in a in a in the time of COVID, which we were extremely limited on our ability to test in labs and could not go at, go to sea. So we kind of came up with a way to actually test the the our vehicle using a simulation. So we took a hint from um, 
from Newton and second law of motion. And basically he said that um, a mass, a mass and acceleration, or a, you can actually move a mass through um, the water by affecting a force on it. And then we can calculate the position of that over by uh, doing that over and over and over again. So um, this is Newton's second law of motion, force equals mass times acceleration for an underwater vehicle that contains all the terms for damping. And um, there's something called the Coriolis force and gravity and buoyancy. And if you're interested in this equation, you can look it up in this book um, by Neil, by Thor Fossen. He's um, probably one of the world's leading underwater controls guys. And um, we took Doc Clausen's equation and we put it in our in MATLAB. This is a, a computer simulation of of our vehicle. So the the red smudge you see there is a, a typical um, migration event, and then our vehicle is doing this stair step pattern by adjusting its buoyancy, trying to control its depth, and then it hits the scattering layer and and then tracks it. And this was a way to actually run thousands and thousands of tests um, of our vehicle without having to be able without being able to uh, put, in, put it in the ocean. Unfortunately, we were, we were kept from um, going out to see this past summer and we'll have to go next summer and probably will not have a chance to deploy it uh, in the water um, before then. We were however able to, um, to before COVID, be a, cobble together a prototype. And um, this is basically a, an older camera that we had created for National Geographic plus a a buoyancy engine that we bolted to it and we tied a fish, you can see a fish on the front that we hope we were hoping that Plagic Sea Life would be interested in, they weren't. Um, and basically that, that this worked with, a, we also had a, a benthos acoustic motor on it so we could talk to it and we threw it in the ocean and, and it, it actually worked pretty well, um, even though it was sort of cobbled together. Um, it, we were able to see lots and lots of sea life when we were in an acoustically defined scattering layer. So we were controlling this vehicle from the surface. So that's a uh, squid interacting with a jellyfish. And we saw all kinds of, of um, predator prey interactions. This is a squid eating a, something called a mctofa, small fish. And then it itself is going to come back into frame or one of its brothers. And um, it's going to get eaten by a larger predator. So, um, and then that flashing you see is actually bioluminescence. So a lot of, a lot of things you um, communicate or signal each other using bioluminescence at these depths. Um, and we were also able to track the, this device. We tested a tracking system um, based on a, it's called ultra sort baseline tracking. And we could communicate with that tracking system and figure out where this thing was and actually recover it. Um, and so uh, we went ahead and started building our concept up. We um, 3D printed a lot of it. And um, this is the, uh, we built three prototypes of this, this version, um, had a camera array, had a, um, these are machine vision cameras and we put something called an NVIDIA Jetson on it so that we it would allow us to do um, sort of machine like uh, um, sort of uh, on the fly AI processing of the imagery or whatever. And, um, and then we tested it in the University of Maryland's pool. So this is actually, um, that's my uh, partner, business partner over there. And then uh, on the right, the the woman in the blue shirt is actually the, she's doing her PhD um, on co collective control and dynamics of our vehicles. So we're working with the University of Maryland. This is their space systems lab pool. And, um, and you can actually see the, the this is a, a kind of a times 10 sped up um, test of the vehicle. So it, it kind of worked. It actually, we're able to get it to control its buoyancy in the pool. The thing hanging from above it is the, the USBL beacon. So we were tracking it as well as communicating with it, sending commands to it. It's only, we can only send like, I think at most maybe uh, 20 bits per second or whatever. So it's it's not not very high bandwidth, but we can actually, can we can talk to it and get status updates. And um, we're actually hoping to get it, have the vehicle tell us what, what how many targets it sees. So it we can see if we're actually in a scattering layer and then get those vehicles to talk to each other, to try to cooperate in finding the scattering layer. Um, so that was an abort test. We just told it to surface. And, um, and it actually, it works pretty well in the pool. So we're gonna, we're planning on taking it out um, this next summer to the Gulf of Mexico. So um, that's a little bit about the technology we're developing. And so we, I've been, we've been working as a business for about a year um, and, uh, it gave us a lot of time to think really, really clearly about, you know, how do we make conservation technology sustainable and how do we develop 
solutions for um, for conservation as a for-profit company. And um, one of the you know things that we were kind of we we kind of knew going into this was that academic and conservation markets are small. Um, you can you you can get lots and lots of money for extracting resources from the environment, but you can't get as much money for um, actually protecting those resources or conserving them. So, um, and then the other issue is developing new technology is expensive. The the tools are get, getting cheaper, especially for hardware development. I bought a um, network analyzer um, when I was in grad school uh, for like thirty thousand dollars, and um, last week I just bought one with roughly the same amount of capability for about $170. So the tools are getting cheaper, but the problem is the um, tech development is extremely labor intensive and time intensive. It just requires a lot of hard work and sitting down, um, especially if you're doing something new. And um, and there's not really a, a good way around that. And um, and so you need money to pay engineers to, you know, because they have to pay their mortgages and stuff. So. Um, how can we sustainably fund technology for conservation? And the, the obvious answer is, I think we need to apply technology transfer. We need to, to, to take a, a look at the kinds of problems that we're solving in the conservation space, and then think about how can we, um, how, can we find, how can we sell those ideas or, or um, solutions to other markets that potentially might have the, the funding and resources to pay for them. And um, so an example is for the, we're, we're developing these plastic ocean sensors. Well, who's looking at um, at putting sensors in the ocean? And the answer is pretty. There, there's a fairly short list, um, and the main one, the, the the folks that are looking the most at um, deep sea plastic sensors is actually the U.S. Navy. So, this is an example of um, sensors that the Navy deploys. This, they and they um, they use things called sono buoys to to actually detect and track. Um, submarines. This is really important to the Navy, and they've spent, you know, a lot of effort and time uh, thinking about this. And the techniques they use are are still fairly old. Actually, this is the this is the technique. They, this was developed in the '60s. Um, you basically fly an airplane over or a submarine, look at listening for it. Once you find it, use a magnet, mag, um, metal detector to track it. And um, so there's the Navy's uh, the Navy and Department of Defense are looking at all kinds of sensors to solve this problem and actually other types of problems, even environmental ones. Um, so if you're thinking about starting a company and you want it to be for profit, um, you know, look really hard at, at um, the available like federal um, funding programs. Um, this is a, the we're, we're actually engaging with the uh, SBIR program and and we're, we're focused right now on, on the Navy SBIR, but there are tons and tons of these types of resources available. There's business consortiums that you can join to get um, get uh, access to the people that have the problems that can pay for solutions, and and then you can use that that to develop technologies that could eventually be um, applied to a conservation space. So that's just my uh, my little my perspective on uh, business and and uh, and conservation. And I, I appreciate the time and thank you for allowing uh, allowing me to speak. And it, it's you know, excited to see what you guys come up with. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for sharing your experiences with pushing conservation technology forward. Um, ending our keynote address today, we have Peter Houlihan. Peter, the current technical lead for the Global Rainforest XPRIZE competition, has led over 50 large scientific expeditions into more than 20 countries to examine how we can better protect and conserve our Earth's rainforests. In addition to collecting information on these understudied regions of the earth, Peter has helped share the science of rainforest conservation internationally, appearing in a BAFTA-nominated BBC series with Sir David Attenborough and starring in the Emmy-nominated PBS documentary, Chasing Ghosts. Please welcome Peter Houlihan and take it away. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Duke and Duke Conservation Tech um, for hosting this. This is a awesome event and certainly something that I wish uh, I, I knew about or had access to. I don't even know if these were happening when I was in school, but this is this is fantastic. And of course, great to also see colleagues at uh, Rainforest Connection and, um, and hear from Eric. So I'm just going to share um, a little bit about XPRIZE Rainforest um, with 
with a bit of a background uh, take on it in terms of why we're hosting this session. And I don't think I need to give, I know a number of people here are involved in competing or have registered teams or pre-registered teams. So I'm going to give a little bit of an overview and then get into really um, some of those aspects of why we're doing this. And then also to some of Eric's points again there about this technology transfer and thinking creatively about the challenges of our time and how we face them. Uh, so, shrink that. XPRIZE, for those of you who don't know, um, I didn't know before I started working for XPRIZE too much about them uh, earlier last year, but the organization designs and operates multi-million dollar global prize competi competitions to push the limits of what's possible and solve the grand challenges of our time. Our mission is to inspire and empower problem solvers to positively impact our world. And we believe that solutions can come from anywhere, anytime, from anyone. And this whole concept, as uh, you all know, doing your own competition just right now, um, this has gone back in terms of exploration for the past century and, and well beyond that in terms of um, incentivizing people to push the limits. And certainly that was the case with Charles Lindbergh flying across the Atlantic. And that inspired the first XPRIZE competition, the Ansari XPRIZE. Uh, 25 years ago that was intended to um, privatize space flight and the winning technology from that competition was purchased by Richard Branson and became what we know now today as Virgin Galactic. Um, over these 25 years, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars have been awarded and um, we currently, I think we actually have 10 prizes and challenges going on now, a number of new ones that came out um, amid COVID and we have a number of uh, additional ones in development, hopefully also expanding on coral reefs and oceans. So stay tuned for those. Um, but the one that I am running right now is uh, the XPRIZE Rainforest and it's a five year, $10 million competition to enhance our understanding of rainforest ecosystems around the world. Um, and to, before getting into that, what I am going to share is just the background of, of why. And, and many people here know today the importance of tropical rainforest from the Amazon to the Congo, Madagascar to Borneo, um, how, the, how these in environments store an immense amount of the planet's biodiversity. Um, and throughout my career, that's been my uh, focus is, is tropical rainforest conservation and the biodiversity in these environments, leading many different scientific and documentary media expeditions, uh, many of them with National Geographic, to document these threatened environments, um, working with indigenous peoples and local communities who uh, live within and adjacent to these communities and share and hold an immense amount of knowledge about them. Um, and under, better understanding this interconnectedness of our planet and biodiversity um, to inform conservation. And as we all are aware, tropical rainforests around the world are um, impacted many different ways through logging, um, mining, agriculture, um, you name it. So, um, and poaching as well. And certainly one of the aspects right now that has come to the forefront through the opening of tropical rainforests in terms of degradation, deforestation, wildlife trafficking, all of these um, additional aspects that come with and are tied together, um, our uh, resilience and sustainability of our own home, our natural habitat um, has become very vulnerable. And of course, now we are facing things like a pandemic um, and fires, the hurricane seasons that we face now are, are far more intense. Um, and all of these things are, are interconnected. And much of that, um, as we know, has to do with uh, ecological tipping points. And you know, right now where we're at with the Amazon is approaching um, these points of no return in terms of ecological collapse. And what I'm going to share right now is just a little bit of the behind the scenes of the expeditions that I've, uh, coordinated logistics for and led over the years with teams of local scientists to document 
tropical rainforest biodiversity to inform conservation action and policy. But as several people know here, this whole process is very time and labor intensive. And as Eric was explaining, the process also of developing new technologies is um, extensive as well. And so right now, given the urgency of the threats that uh, we face in tropical rainforests, while I and many others love the field biology aspect of expeditions, we, don't, we simply don't have the same amount of time to carry out these extensive processes. Um, while this work will always be important, we need to continually um, find ways to more rapidly, remotely monitor and document um, and collect data and analyze data from these environments. And so um, many of these slides are from uh, just dozens of expeditions around tropical rainforests around the world. But um, this process of spending months or years in the field collecting data, um, unfortunately, we just we don't have that time for many of the actions that need to be taken these days. Um, and so that really inspired these aspects of XPRIZE Rainforest and incentivizing novel technologies. And of course, there are technologies that we have been using, um, deploying in tropical rainforests around the world to monitor biodiversity. And um, if we can revolutionize this technology even further, um, the awesome thing about this group at Duke is the intersection of conservation and technology um, is just an amazing fusion of skill sets and expertise, but it's still yet to emerge as its own self-sustaining industry. You have people at organizations like Rainforest Connection, um, Eric's group that are, are, and Shah Selby who's speaking I think tomorrow at Conservify, people who are working in this space, really driving it forward, but we really need um, to push this forward as much as possible, push this needle together um, in many different ways to deploy these audio monitors in tropical rainforests, um, remote camera traps in canopies, and in many different respects, technologies in different sectors may already exist that could apply to tropical rainforests and just haven't been yet. And so that's where I think we need to think um, in very interdisciplinary ways, but also collaborative ways coming from academia or tech sectors. I think we're all aware that many different fields are, are pretty siloed. Um, and if we can expand beyond that and form very interdisciplinary, international creative teams, I think we can come up with new breakthroughs uh, to solutions and, and certainly one of the things that I've enjoyed throughout my career is, is, is doing that in just by taking things into the canopy. A lot of my work has been in tree climbing and, and canopy work. And um, here just a year ago in the Congo Basin, we were installing a, a wireless network in, in Cameroon and that feeds off of um, new technology as well with you know, companies like SpaceX putting new satellites um, in the atmosphere. So, um, all of that is to say the complex nature of tropical rainforests, we are here focused on um, the most complex terrestrial environments on the planet. And I think that is one aspect of the sheer biodiversity in these environments that lure many of us in to study these places. It also makes um, the challenges facing them very tricky and therefore the solutions that we um, employ in conservation for tropical rainforests must be you know equally diverse and varied um, and complex in nature and so with that um, i'm going to share just a quick video about um, xprize rainforest i might have to reshare my screen very quickly uh, there you go
the rainforest, an area home to more species than anywhere else on Earth. I feel like I'm in the heart of everything. There's a thriving that is really powerful. An area that cleans our air, purifies our water, and holds many of the important solutions to tomorrow's problems. This rainforest is instrumental to the survival of the entire human race. We need to protect what we have. The future of humanity is at stake. How can we monitor a large area of forests that would provide us with a view of the tropical forest functioning? We need nature. So uh, just a few last points on this with that um, nice intro and uh, powerful words from one of our advisory board members, Harrison Ford. Um, teams can come from anywhere, uh, anywhere in the world. We are thrilled with the teams that we have competing, um, especially those of you at Duke that we're just absolutely very excited about that. Um, and what we're looking for is for these interdisciplinary teams with a variety of expertise, skill sets, um, experience in everything from robotics, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, um, and then many different aspects of biology and remote sensing, big data, everything to really come together and think about the challenges that we face in tropical rainforests along with this timeline. The, the point here is not to solve rainforests. It's, it's to advance the technology that we can um, use as tools and employ the, deploy those around the world um, more rapidly to uh, act and inform policy, empower indigenous peoples and local communities. There are a variety of different ways um, and we really encourage uh, people to form teams. One thing um, that I'll just add to that, there's of course in that $10 million prize purse, the winning team will take home $5 million, second place $2 million and third place half a million. And there are different milestone prizes throughout the competition for those that make it to our different rounds of field testing. But there are also a lot of additional benefits of competing. There's a lot of exposure um, by competing in an X Prize competition. And some companies and organizations, student led groups have actually secured more investments from venture capitalists, philanthropies, donors um, to support their technology and their companies then some winning teams have actually gotten from us at XPRIZE um, through that prize purse. And so there's a lot of exposure, both in media, in um, the financial sectors and things like that. Um, we have some great partners that we've been bringing on board and we're also establishing various uh, educational partnerships as well. So um, we're really, uh, I've, I've been happy with how we've shaped this into a movement to be much more of a community and we hope that you know everybody working in rainforests in different ways um, considers being a part of this. And with that, um, we I can share more information at any time. You can find all of this at our website at rainforest.xprize.org. 
Um, we're releasing our updated guidelines, our rules and regulations this week, and some really important uh, imminent uh, dates to be aware of is registration closes on March 15th. We are going to be sending out um, information about an event that we're hosting next month with our ecosystem. So check that out. And those who fully register by the end of that time will receive 25% off the full registration uh, of, of the competition. So feel free to reach out. Um, anybody who's interested in competing, I'm always happy to speak with you directly. Don't hesitate to, uh, to contact us. So with that, thank you all for hosting this. Um, it's a pleasure to share more. Thanks. Okay, thank you to all of our speakers. Those were some really incredible speeches and I think that they're going to really help our teams as they start thinking about their ideation process and what kind of projects they wanna pursue. Um, so now we are going to open up to questions. Any questions anyone has for our speakers, you can either raise your hand if you need to unmute or you're free to send them in the chat. Um, and quick announcement. So Duke is already registered as Blue Devil Rainforest Divers. Um, so. Yep, I'm well aware. And I loved, uh, I loved the video that you all put together for that matchmaking event. And we're, we're very excited for you all. Okay, looks like people are being a bit shy. Um, so I had a question for Eric um, about the ocean sensor he talked about. Uh, Eric, what do you think was one of the biggest challenges you faced in developing that or are facing right now? Um, um, I guess it's access to testing right now. It's uh, we're, We were hoping to open an office um, right around the time that, uh, I guess, March or so last year. And um, and we, we've been kind of stuck. This is actually my house behind me. My, my It's a bedroom converted into a lab. Um, and so uh, just being able to, um, in hardware development, at least, it just requires a ton of testing. You design and build something, maybe that takes you know, 30% of the time. And then the rest of the time you, you just figure out how to test it and test it and test it. So, you know, it works in the field. So that's, I guess that's been the number one challenge right now. Thank you. Uh, I think someone had a raised hand and then made it down. If you have your question, you're welcome to unmute and ask it. Yeah, I had a, hey, I'm Jacob. I had a question for Zephyr. Um, I was wondering for, with your soundscapes, how you were able to distinguish between um, animals that produce sounds that the microphones couldn't pick up, like wavelengths that weren't captured there, um, and if there were any overlapping wavelengths between animals so that you couldn't distinguish between two different, different sound um, identifiers. Yeah, so um, yeah, great question. So yeah, there, there definitely are species that are outside of the frequency ranges that, uh, that were shown in that soundscape analysis. Um, and Marconi, you may wanna add a little bit more information to this, but there are different devices that uh, are, are capable of capturing certain levels in the frequency range. And so, um, so our guardians that we have are, uh, are able to capture up to a certain level of frequency and then the audio moth devices are able to capture a, a greater frequency range. Um, so, so you are correct that there definitely are going to be some species that are outside the range, but I believe, Marconi, if you wanna correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the majority of species though in the tropical rainforests are within the range that was shown in the soundscape analysis. Is that correct? Yeah, mo most birds, frogs, and mammals, uh, and some insects like 
a great um, most part of insects, but there is like Zeph said, like the bats and, and some insects are in greater frequencies. But again, with the audio moth and other uh, recorders, we are able to capture that, those sounds too. And then, sorry, Jacob, there was a second part of your question and I, I just forgot what it was. Um, I think I asked, um, oh, overlapping. Um, and oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark, honey, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Like how you would go through and, and see like the overlapping sounds? I think you would need to just, you need to zoom in and like more carefully right. analyze those recordings, right? Yeah. Yeah, with, with the soundscape, if you have an overlapping sound, so yeah, so that will be, you know, like you, you can't uh, distinguish that in the soundscape per se, but remember that, you know, like even if uh, a, a specific sound has uh, overlap in, in, in a time period, because we are leaving the recorders there for several weeks and months or, and, or years, we, we will definitely have that, that species or their other sound without their overlap at some point. But again, the idea for me of the soundscape is like Zeph said, is, is more as an holistic approach where, and, and then you, we can dig in and create these species specific identification models so that you can really track what you are more interested in. Thank you. I also saw that there was another question that came through that I can also speak to as well, um, because we are we do a lot in the area of I didn't talk too much about that today, but in the area of protecting rainforests against um, illegal threats such as illegal logging. Um, so so yes, there's a huge huge issue with um, enforcement of laws, getting there in time. Like both of those are are big problems. So just to kind of as an example, uh, this just happened recently in one of our sites. So we have a we have a guardian, which is like a, a, an acoustic sensor that's running, that's streaming constantly, um, that then uh, we using AI are able to detect sounds of, of illegal chainsaw noise. And uh, we inform partners on the ground, you know, that, hey, this is a bunch of chainsaw noises that are occurring. And we let them know exactly where they can go, where the, these people that we partner with on the ground can actually go and, and intervene. So part of the problem is that um, you know, rainforests are huge, right? So you, it takes, sometimes it takes hours to actually hike to a specific area to actually be able to e even intervene. Um, the other challenge that we have is that it's very difficult with some of these places like in Brazil, for instance, um, just, you know, with challenges with the government and corruption and things like that to actually be able to do anything about it. So, you know, we have one one site right now that they're able to get a lot of data on like, yes, you know, here, these were the these were the sounds that came through. This is how long, you know, they were logging for. It was eight hours. We have all these reports. We have pictures. We have all this information, all this data, you know, and then we hand it over to like law enforcement and then nothing happens. So there's um, tremendous challenges of not just being able to identify that's happening. Like we are identifying it's happening. It's happening all the time. It's terrible, actually. It's just over the last few weeks, there's just been constant activity, chainsaw activity, and very little that anyone was able to actually do to, to protect those forests. And so um, there's, you know, we, we work really closely with trying to build as many partnerships on the ground with any kind of like law enforcement, any kind of um, anyone who's interested in, in being able to do something about this, you know, to actually take these people and 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 do something to to stop them. Um, but it's it's extremely challenging. It's a very challenging area of of focus, and we try as much as possible to to um, to target that. But it's it's quite challenging. So I would say that there's barriers in in all those different areas. Um, getting there in time, as well as just the lack of enforcement of the laws. Thank you, Zephyr. It looks like there's another question in the chat uh, about X Prize. All right, let me, let me pull it up. <laughs> um, and I, I agree completely with what Zephyr just said. I was just in the Brazilian Amazon last month. Um, 
and some of those images I shared were, were from there. So um, what kind of environmental justice issues and solutions do competitions go over for X prize events specifically related to indigenous people? Um, yeah, so we have X prize rainforest was started primarily as a technology competition. And certainly when I came on board, I wanted to find as many ways as possible for this competition to benefit our field. Um, a competition of this scale, I thought was uh, really amazing to be focused on rainforests and for conservation in this uh, field to be successful, of course, it needs to be inclusive of indigenous peoples and local communities who, um, you know, about 80% of the biodiversity on the planet exists on indigenous lands and many indigenous peoples and local communities are far better stewards of that land um, than any other alternatives. And so through this competition, we've established an IPLC working group um, with, uh, along with many of our partners. So with the GCF task force, Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force, with their um, IPLC working group, as well as organizations like Neotero and others. It's a very, um, as well as some of our advisory board members. And so um, basically what we're doing, given that it's such a long-term prize, it's a, we're one year into a five-year competition. And the intent is to just um, have regular meetings and consult and um, with this group throughout every stage of the competition, but also after the close of registration, to provide immersive workshop experiences for our teams. So um, that of course is going to be COVID dependent. We have a few in mind that will start um, probably this summer virtually that will provide access to our teams to different conservation tech uh, case studies with different um, communities around the world. What has worked, lessons learned, things like that. Um, we'll start a few of those events virtually this year and then throughout the competition provide um, more opportunities for engagement and learning and that knowledge transfer throughout understanding that um, there is a lot of knowledge that is already contained and amassed uh, about these environments that needs to be included into other um, traditional or whatever um, approaches. So uh, there, there are many different ways in which we're working towards this and Always happy to speak more to that. Thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? Just raise your hand or type in chat. Uh, Joyce. Um, this question is for all of the speakers, um, whoever wants to answer, but um, recently I saw like an article about um, how like the Amazon would be degraded by like 2064 due to deforestation um, and just going off of that given like the abundance of like doom and gloom discourse about these various topics in the rainforest um, and degradation and all of that what gives you hope to continue tackling these projects um, and like what energizes you as you're working on these efforts? I can, I can say a few words. I'm sure we all have plenty <laughs> um, on that. And, and certainly I think um, the doom and gloom is something that we're all familiar with. I think everybody's aware of the threats like on a large scale of that rainforest globally face. And at times, you know, you have to take the small victories to stay motivated. I think that right now, um, that, that paper that you just referenced that just came out is one of the first to just blatantly put a date on that tipping point um, to savannization of the Amazon. But um, I think that in a sense like that drives my continued motivation is there's so much urgency to it that you almost, um, uh, you just have to keep working. <laughs> um, I think that it's interesting. A lot of my work is also in media and it's always been interesting to kind of ride that line of, um, you know, how for a long time, I think there was generations that we kind of grew up watching natural history documentaries that were showcasing the beauty of the world that kind of inspired you through that way and not showing too much of the gloom to turn people away. Right now, I think we're at a point where we have this decade 
um, to really urgently make a huge difference. Um, there isn't that time to um, wait to inspire a next generation. I think it's all on us inherently to do it right now. So for me, that's the motivation. Um, I'm sure everybody has different opinions and, and perspectives on that. <laughs> yeah, I can just add a few a few thoughts as well. So so something that's been really inspiring for me is is actually working more closely. Just in the last few months, I've gotten more involved. I've, I've been more on the technical side of Rainforest Connection, but moving now more towards really looking to see how our products are creating actual real impact in the conservation space. And what's been really inspiring for me is to see like there's so many people that really want to make a difference in this space. Like there are, you know, there's these organizations, these partners that we we have on the ground, these indigenous groups. There's all these people that are like desperate to protect their land, right? And they want to do everything possible to to protect whether it's Amazon or or any any protect any area, any you know, forests around the world. And um, and so when we come in and we say, hey, we have some technology to help you do your jobs. Um, they're just like so grateful for that, you know, and it, it, it gives them the, the tools that they need to be able to be successful, you know, because they can't cover huge, huge amounts of rainforest on their own, just with their own ears, right? They need to be able to know, like, where are these chainsaw noises coming from? So, uh, so, so it's super inspiring to meet all these people around the world that really are dedicated to or and committed to this, you know, this is like, this is their, their area, this is their land, like they want to protect it so much. And so, for me, that's really inspiring. And, um, and just in general, like, even just in the US, like the number of people that reach out to us all the time that are like, really passionate about conservation, climate change, wanting to wanting to make a difference. We get probably 10 people every week that want to work with us in some capacity, at least, you know, and, um, and that's really inspiring for me. And I've never I, you know, spent most of my career in um, like the for profit space. And it's just like, it just gives me so much like, I don't know how to like it's like super motivating to come to work and just be surrounded by all these people who really care deeply about nature you know so I can't even imagine like not doing this anymore because it's just like it's just so motivating to be around other people who care so I highly recommend it to anybody you know anyone who's interested in this kind of space you know I highly recommend finding a way to to make a difference so thanks. And I'll just add one one point. Uh, speaking as an engineer, um, I, I think the the big picture doom and gloom is can be disheartening. But like, I, if if you're passionate about engineering, you're passionate about solving problems, and more problems keep coming, and more you know, allows you to think about solutions. So, I uh, I it, it maybe sounds banal, but um, that's, that's what I always told the folks over at Pristine Seeds was they had lots and lots of problems. So I could, could try to wrap my head around it. And that's what kept me going. I'll just add to one more thing on that note, Eric, is I think that's what excited me about XPRIZE Rainforest is that it was solution oriented of um, charging people to come together to come up with solutions. And I think that um, there's the, doom and gloom aspect, but I don't think it's productive to just dwell on that, um, you know, actually doing something about it with the skills and ed expertise and education um, is, is ways that people can always contribute. So um, yeah, great question. All right, it seems like there's another question in the chat from Connor. What are the methods to restoring ecologically damaged sites in the rainforest? What challenges come with these methods? And how are US companies or the US government involved in the destruction of the rainforest? Uh, <laughs> nobody wants to touch this one. Um, well, the first part, uh, restoring ecologically damaged sites. I think it, going back to Zephyr's point about um, governance and with every single location that we work in, there are different methods, there are different policies, there are different actions. Um, and so certainly I think the on the ground aspects of working locally, um, there are many different, that's a whole field of restoration. Um, certainly the challenges that that come with that are 
you know, the ways in which places have been ecologically damaged in the first place. Um, and what, what structure, what framework is in place to really um, support these efforts. Uh, so I think that, that that's a very broad, um, I think one of the things that we face is how different approaches are in all of these different tropical locations um, and how restoration takes place in the Brazilian Amazon is different from Colombian Amazon and Ecuador versus the Congo Basin and, and Borneo. So um, I think that with all of these things, there are lessons that we learn globally across tropical ecology. And also there's a necessity to work locally and understand the intricacies of those systems um, and the communities that live there and um, the threats facing them. So it's both individualizing things while also learning, I think, collectively across, across the globe on what works and what doesn't work. Um, that's kind of a general answer. <laughs> How can trustworthy relationships be developed with indigenous groups when the US has such an imperialist reputation? I can try to answer that <laughs> um, slowly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, our approach has always been that we are like we're not coming in and we're telling we're not telling other people what we think they should do. So we are coming in and we are getting to know these different groups that are already established, like I mentioned, that are already committed to, you know, wanting to protect their, the land. Um, and we're just coming in to provide them with the tools and technology to help them better do those jobs. So I think it's, it's taken a lot of um, time to, you know, develop trust with these groups. Um, but also, I think that they see that we're not trying to we're not trying to come in and like dominate the whole process or anything. We just really want to empower them with these tools and technologies. So that has been for us an extremely effective approach. And I think it is pretty unique. There's not a lot of other um, nonprofits that, that do that, um, especially ones that are providing like tools and technology. And so I think we have to be very, very careful and very mindful of um, just the, the different cultural and you know practices that, that differ with ours. So a lot of that just comes with like time and patience, like just as a practical example, um, we're working with a site right now in Western Sumatra and, you know, we have to be really mindful of um, making sure that we don't schedule calls when they're doing their prayer practices or we are um, very patient, you know, if we have to wait 30 minutes, 45 minutes to get on a call with them, like we just kind of have to wait, you know, or it's, it's, it's like we're operating on jungle time, you know, so <laughs> you have to be um, just really aware of what those sort of cultural traditions are, practices are, and be able to, um, to kind of like um, be patient, I think I would say. So just, but yeah, that, that's a, there's lots of other pieces to that question, but I think that just gives like a, a general overview there, things to consider. If I can just add a quick point to that, I think it's also including people in the process through co-design and partnership rather than this like distant beneficiary of um, we're going to do this hand it off and it will benefit um, you know I think the process of co-designing projects together working on things as partners um, is one provides an opportunity to be informed of the knowledge and policies and practice um, that exist there and that people already have um, but it also ensures that those solutions will be successful in the end because the people that you or we say that it's going to benefit were included and involved in the process from the start and throughout. And that's certainly going back to Zephyr's point involves a lot of times, I think for us as field biologists, um, that you know can mean living in communities or living in different areas, fully immersed for long periods of time, learning languages, um, and not going in even with your project at the forefront first, but getting to know people and what uh, those challenges are inherently and then figuring it out, but not going in like with this, all these preconceived notions of this is how it's gonna work before I even get on a plane and go somewhere, but um, kind of developing it organically and being willing to admit, admit you're totally wrong and adapt those ideas and 
Um, I would always advocate for learning languages everywhere you work um, and putting in that work to be able to have those conversations um, with people directly. Thank you. It sounds like you've done it a lot, many times. But before this year, that was, that was my whole life. <laughs> Okay, uh, it looks like we have two more questions in the chat and then after those. While the advancement and spread of conservation technology is impressive, degradation is still occurring rapidly. Would it not be a better use of resources to provide environmental education to those who destroy rainforest habitat which preemptive suppression versus mitigation and introduce alternative livelihood opportunities? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it gets to the, the next question too, which is really the, you know, the root of so much of this is the, is the demand. So, you know, us in the West, we have this huge demand and then that drives, that drives a lot of the rainforest destruction. So, I mean, there's there's so many you know amazing like documentaries and all kinds of research that's been done in this area that would probably I'd probably do a much better job at explaining it than than I ever could. But I think that you know we have to look at ourselves and like what our own we have to look at like our own role in how we play into this the demand side of things um, because it's really it's a you know it's a really good point. Like if people don't have, I mean someone you know someone in like Ecuador, for instance, if they're getting $3 for every tree that they cut down, um, that's a lot of money for them. And they're going to do that because that's the only option that they have. They don't have another um, way of, of earning a livelihood. And they're not, they may not necessarily want to be illegally logging, but that's just all that they have as a chance to do. And, um, but, you know, so the demand is really what drives so much of this. So I don't really have any <laughs> answers necessarily to that because it's such a a com complex, you know, uh, just all the different systems are all kind of all, all interacting there. Um, so there's not an easy solution necessarily other than, you know, individually, we do need to raise awareness as much as possible. And we need to look at our own choices as well. What are we doing to contribute to that demand? Yeah, I, I would also say, so the way the question's phrased, I think sometimes we also all face um, that certain things are more effective than others or something should be done instead of a different approach. I think um, contrary, like we actually need more people in, across all sectors focused on this same um, environment and solutions towards that coming from many different backgrounds. And like full disclosure, I guess, when I came on board at XPRIZE, that was one of my questions of, so we have this prize purse, we have this operational budget on top of that, I know what, if I formed my own organization and had that budget, um, what would be the impact of us, you know, working on those local levels with that money? And it actually was like, there were two parts of that for me. One being the idea behind the competition is exponential. So what we need to get out of this competition and all of the teams competing and solutions is really catapulting these aspects of the field forward um, in, in a pretty astronomical way, which is certainly exciting. But then there's um, also the other aspects, the added parts of it along the way of building in educational components, building in many different ways to ensure that the impact of it can be scaled. Um, and, and a lot of this also gets into totally different aspects of um, like governance and people talking about land management and the US and diff different aspects of this, um, you know, getting into the economics of all these things, all of these approaches are necessary. It's not that one is the only way. I think um, we need to be working collaboratively to actually pull in more people from different sectors uh, and use their expertise who have maybe never thought about applying their skill set to rainforest before. Um, so we need, we certainly need uh, as many people as possible, I think, in this process. Okay, 
Well, thank you all for coming out um, and speakers for taking the time to do this. We really appreciate it. And I think you guys have been incredibly helpful um, and insightful.